It looks a little smaller than I thought. Okay, hold on. <laughs> all right, hang on. In just about 10 more minutes, we can all go to dinner cruise. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom. Um, I work for a company called Western Asset, and today I'm going to share with you a use case about uh, uh, risk management in the financial services industry. So um, who is Western Asset, right? So Western Asset is a, a globally integrated fixed income manager, okay? Um, what's great about Western Asset is that we treat our client as, as our first priority, okay? And um, also, we have a globally integrated team, meaning that everyone uh, working in a global location work with each other to service our clients. And um, also, we have an integrated risk management crew. So the team actually work very closely with the portfolio managers and client service executives so that we can service our clients the best we could. Um, Western Assets has about $436 billion in asset under management as of end of March uh, 2019. And so in our risk management use case, we have to run what, uh, the Monte Carlo simulation, right? So what does it do? So we have to um, predict 10,000 future scenarios across almost 1,000 risk factors. These risk factors are being modeled by the risk managers. They are highly talented PhDs who work through the time series modeling and figure out how they should be um, uh, behaving. And at the end of the day, we have 10,000 potential um, security returns for every security that we modeled every day. Okay, um, so the magic comes from this, uh, what we call the valuation matrix. It, this three-dimensional uh, array basically captures the security returns uh, with different components such as systematic return or idiosyncratic return for all the securities and all the future states. Um, the scale is about 130,000 securities that we have to um, evaluate every day uh, across these, these 10,000 states. Um, so uh, the output is pretty, you know, pretty simple. We do risk statistics. So uh, you can uh, get expected returns, which is really nothing but the mean of uh, the uh, security returns, tracking errors, uh, value at risk, and expected shortfall. So um, from an upstream process, we have these 130,000 files that came from a, a system written in SAS. So how do we do this, right? So we take these files, we load them into a shared memory region, um, using the distributed macro, okay? And we use a, a, a open source library, saslib.jl, which is also my package. Um, once the data is in shared memory, we can use the same trick. Basically, we, we do all these risk statistics and we calculate all the um, returns and portfolio risk data and we save them back as CSV files. So everything is really, really fast. Um, how do we deploy the application, right? So uh, what we did in this project is that we take a portion of our legacy code, we ported it to Julia, and we just deployed it into a corporate Docker Swarm environment, okay? Um, in, um, in this uh, project, we want to measure how, how good the performance is. So these are the two boxes that we use for running our legacy code. Right, and you, you can see that these are you know, enterprise class uh, servers that has a lot of CPUs and, and lo a lot of memory. And um, in, with the legacy system, we can only process about 250 portfolios and that runs for seven hours. Um, really, um, what we really wanted to do is to run 800 portfolios, uh, but we can't even do it because we don't have that many hours in a day. So uh, we do this project, we pull a portion of that code to Julia, and we deploy that to a single Docker node um, that has access to about 10 CPUs and 128 gigabytes of memory. The result, we can actually process all 800 portfolios in just under five hours. 
this is tremendous gain for uh, the business. Okay, so um, as part of this process, we also have to do a lot of integration, uh, such as um, you know, accessing the Oracle database and also uh, as, you know, get, sending and receiving messages to the Kafka uh, messaging system. So we took the approach of using PyCore uh, because we can tap into the high quality Python packages, um, in this case, CX Oracle and PyKafka, and that works out really, really well. Uh, we also did a couple of proof of concepts using CLang, for example, we can wrap around the financial calculation C library and be able to access all those functions easily. Um, as well as using zero MQ is another way for us to um, further distribute our workload across multiple Docker nodes. Uh, you may wonder what kind of challenges that we, uh, in, in, you know, we face in our project. Well, first of all, since we're using shared memory, right, we've got to make sure that we have enough memory uh, to be allocated in the Docker environment. So with Docker, we have to uh, specify this you know, specific option so that you, you would allocate enough memory to store our valuation matrix data. Uh, if you don't do this, Julia will actually crash. Um, we are still um, dealing with the physical memory constraint, right? So in a Docker Swarm environment, because everyone is using the same environments to deploy the application, we want to be a good citizen. So we can't really use up too much memory. Uh, we try to consume uh, as little memory as possible. Um, in some cases, we actually we code some of the um, data frame operations and code them you know, as uh, loops instead. All right. so. Um, Corporate firewalls, if you come from a corporation, you know what I mean. Um, this is something that you don't want to fight. Um, what should you do? You know, make friends with your security team. For sure, you can work out your solution with your security team. Um, likewise, with corporate policy and procedures, just be patient and never give up. You'll get there too. All right. All right, so um, in the end of the day, we have happy customers, and with happy customers, we can do even more, right? Such as delivering even more business value by um, you know, coding more use cases, or just migrating existing legacy code to Julia. Or we can also explore other potential use cases that um, Julia might be a fit. Well, Western Asset, we are always looking for talents. If you're interested, just um, give me a shout after the, the talk. Lastly, I want to tell you that I'm writing a book right now. This is called Hands-On Design Patterns with Julia. Um, I'm trying to get it out by the end of the year. Um, and I like to use this book to give back to the community here because I feel that a lot of the ideas that I organize and put together in this book actually come from you, right? So actually, I, I would like to thank all of you for that. Having said that, that's the end of the talk. Um, I, I guess we're open for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Is uh, every security price individually? Correct. Every security is priced individually. So I would imagine not every security use every price, right? Uh, so I would imagine that why you need, you need to load everything in shared memory. Okay. Not every single security price and you don't also load in just what you need. Right. So the question was, why do we need to load everything into memory? Uh, because not every security needs to be priced for every portfolio. Is that what you're thinking? Right, so we do need to do that because what happens is that we have, we have to process more than one portfolio. We have 800 of them to deal. So that 130,000 securities actually held or in the benchmark for, uh, for those portfolios. Um, by loading everything in memory, we don't have to go back to the disk. So, so That's right. So once all the data got loaded into the shared memory, it's accessible by all the processes within the same node. Um, we thought about doing it uh, more with more distributed later on. Um, if we have to scale it if, you know, horizontally, then we can add more nodes and everyone just needs to load the files into their own shared memory region. Uh, at the end of the day, with that large matrix, it's actually not that big. We're talking about 30 gigabytes of data. Shared memory between all the 
Oh, um, so the question is, what, what do we use to store the, the data in shared memory? It's just a plain shared array in Julia. It's, it's very straightforward. Uh, <laughs> yeah, question? Oh, so the question is whether we have given some thoughts to run the code on GPU. Um, answer is no, uh, because we feel that we have a fast enough system today and we don't have to go to GPU at the moment. Um, in, in the future, when we have to, for example, do security evaluation using, um, uh, let's say, pricing a, a, a bond with a callable option, we, in that case, we might have to tap into the GPU power because there will be a lot more computation than what we do today in this use case. That's correct. So today, in this use case, we're talking about a batch process that we just have to finish at the end of the day so we have enough time for our London crew to come in and use the data. In the future, if we do need to make it real time, like pricing the bond or pricing the options, for the portfolio manager for trading purpose, then you're right, we might have to you know, optimize it even further. Yeah. Have you tried to push, uh, as far as you can, the number of uh, Monte Carlo simulations you run? Because like you said, uh, 10,000 is a fair enough number. Have you ever tried maybe 100,000, 20,000? Okay, so the question is, uh, do we have any plans or thoughts about increasing the uh, number of uh, simulations from 10,000 to some number that's higher. Um, and I actually don't have the answer to that. Um, 10,000 is a number that I, we, we've got from the risk management team. Um, from what I heard in the past, they feel that 10,000 is the right number. Anything less doesn't give us enough insight. Anything, anything more may be just too much work that's unnecessary. So, um, but I think situation may change in the future. Okay. So any other questions? The, the scenarios, where do they come from? The different interest rate scenarios. Oh, okay. So the question is where does the scenarios come from? Right? So think about these risk factors that I talked about. There are 1,000 of, of them. Everyone is really a time series. So we have risk managers that look at the uh, past history with the time series. They do the modeling on them um, so that we know how they might move. Uh, together in the future. So uh, we take all these 1,000 risk factors together and we generate a correlation matrix, right? So based upon that uh, covariance matrix, we can generate uh, uh, and forecast the future where they're still correlated the same way as what we thought they should be. Okay, and I also want to thank Simon. He actually a consultant worked with us um, when we work on this project and was a great help. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thanks, Tom. And All right. Thank you. Thank you.